Good morning. My name is Doug Bartoli. I'm President and CEO of Inplay Oil Corp, and it's a pleasure to be speaking to you today at Noblecom 17. 2020 was a difficult year for many, and, and the oil patch was hit uh, extremely hard during that year. With that said, uh, we've been able to come out of that in a very, very strong position, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, telling you our exciting story and, and how we're in the early stages of a rebound. I don't do this very often, but I'm going to put a couple of slides up uh, just to start. And, you know, why am I bullish or, or, you know, optimistic about what's going on here? But this is a great slide where it shows WTI price versus the inverse of U.S. daily storage. And if you go back to 11, 2011 to 2014, you can see that the correlation is very, very tight there. And you get about an $80 to $110 WTI price uh, when you've got, you know, give or take 20 days of, of U.S. storage. Then in 2014, at the end, uh, OPEC and, and Saudi hit the market trying to stop the, the U.S. shale growth and over flooded the market. You can see the drastic drops. Again, pretty good correlation. Then as you move through 2016 to 18, uh, you're getting to see the oil price uh, move up as the storage starts moving down. Then you had a couple, a good flat year in 2019 with strong correlations, consistent. And then, of course, uh, the spring of 2020 and the, the, the severe demand destruction by the pandemic causing uh, oil price to drop and significant um, U.S. days of storage of over 40 days there. But the good thing is in the second half of the year, that trend is going in the right direction where you're starting to see uh, the U.S. storage days uh, around 34 days and, and going in the right direction and WHI following suit. And why are things different? You're gonna hear me talk about it a little bit and let's just focus on a few things. And I got three points here. And our first point is the US growth in, in production. US companies were spending three to five times more capital in many cases than their cash flow to grow production at all costs. Not a great return on capital. Uh, through that price range, there was a little bit of price appreciation in WTI, but, but just consistent. Then at that time, at the peak, you had just under 1,200 oil rigs drilling a day in the U.S. Take a look what happened when we went to the pandemic. We went to just above 200, and we're still in the 200 uh, rigs of oil, oil rigs drilling in the U.S. right now. Reduction of over 75%. Why has it changed? And you could argue my point three that it occurred prior to the pandemic, but Wall Street, Bay Street, everybody's been looking for return on capital. No more growth for growth's sake. It's going to be more live within your means as you go forward. And I can tell you we're one of those companies that can do that. So back to InPlay. Investment highlights. We're a very strong technical management team um, operating in, a, in a, a sustainable light oil company in a very difficult environment. We've been significant, um, consistently in significant growth in our production and living within our funds flow. We're in two of the most exciting plays in the basin, being the uh, Cardium play, which we're, is our main focus, where we're spending all of our CapEx, and we have a long-term light oil Duvernay shale play. Between 18 and 19, we grew our production between 7 and 18% per year, or 17% per year. Again, within funds flow. Going into 2020, that changed. But I'm happy to say, in 2021, we're back on that growth path. And in fact, our guidance of 5,100 to 5,400 BUEs a day is higher than our average production in 2019 or pre-COVID. I don't know very many companies that are going to be above those pre-COVID levels uh, in 2021. That's significant organic growth, drill bit growth year um, into 2021. And more importantly, with all of our cost-cutting measures, significant funds flow and we're somewhere between 23 and 30% free funds flow, which will be used to pay down debt. Our operational and technical expertise, our high quality asset base, is what drives top quartile efficiencies. We can live within our means. That's the key to thriving in a new, uh, this fundamentally changed oil and gas industry that I talk about. You gotta live within your funds flow. Access to equity and to debt is not as easy as it once was. Continuing on our investment highlights, we acted quickly. Our response to the COVID-19 pandemic immediately stopped all capital programs, reviewed all of our wells, curtailed wells, shut in wells that were not making any money uh, at those low prices, reduced our production. We implemented cost cutting initiatives that reduced our costs from our original budget by 25%. We believe 10 to 15% of that will continue going forward. 
and we aggressively pursued government programs to help with liquidity and, and programs that were available to pre-COVID viable companies. So with that, our liquidity and sustainability has been secured. First and foremost, we got a $25 million uh, four-year second lien term loan from the Business Development Bank of Canada. In Q3, we started initiated well workovers of wells that were down and bringing on curtailed production. We were actually able to complete a highly strategic and accretive acquisition in the fourth quarter as well. Not only uh, was it done at very, very favorable metrics, it was done on a, on a property that's gonna be a significant part of our drilling inventory and where we drill in, in the upcoming years. We're back to business. We're actively accelerating our recovery plan and we're getting our way back to continued measure growth. We resumed the capital program in the fourth quarter. We drilled four extended reach horizontal wells in our Williston Green play that came on in the last week of 2020. And our production's already exceeding our COVID, uh, pre-COVID levels in 2019. Corporate overview. Again, I talked about our guidance. We've got solid reserves here. Um, you can see our shares outstanding at 68.3 million basic. We're about 90 million enterprise value with a $26 million Canadian market cap today. 150,000 shares is our average liquidity a day in the last six months. 7% uh, uh, owned by the insiders. And we have uh, people on the board that are shareholders that are just under 30%. And uh, so again, solid uh, institutional presence um, that are, are representing on our board. At the end of Q3, we're drawn about 61 million on 90 million of total facilities. So again, in an enviable position amongst my light oil junior peers. All of our bios are in the back of this presentation and on our website, but again, very strong technical team, um, you know, managing through this very, very challenging and volatile environment. And strong representation from shareholders on our board, as well as industry experienced and savvy members who've been very uh, uh, helping a lot with through the pandemic and the COVID crisis. This is always my favorite slide. This is our production growth pretty much within funds flow since we went public in 2016. So the light greens, the oil uh, and natural gas liquids and the orange is natural gas. But again, you can see consistent growth over 150% since our inception in 16 going public. The blue squares is our production per share growth. And I always say, if you can grow on a per share basis, in the end, you should be adding value to your shareholder base. 2020, I wish I could erase that, uh, but you can't. But again, we're back on levels above our 2019 here in 2021. So uh, pretty enviable spot. Not a lot of companies I know can do that. Same thing on our reserve basis from 2016 forward. Every year we're growing in the three categories, proved, producing, total proven, which is a P90 case of our undeveloped locations, and provedless problem, which is a P50 case of our undeveloped locations. So just consistent, solid growth every year. Efficiencies, we are finding reserves in the ground as efficient as any of our light oil peers here in Canada. We're either number one or number two in finding costs in 2019, as you can see by this chart. With that said, our recycle ratios are also sizable at over two times. So what does that mean? It's, it's oil field uh, um, jargon for investing $1 and you return $2 on a recycle basis. Typically on the uh, oil side, anything over one and a half is, is solid and anything over two is, uh, is spectacular. Environmental leadership. Every year we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We've been consistent with that. We've also been spending four to 5% of our funds flow on decommissioning of assets. We'll continue to do that. We've had no spills, no lost time accidents over the last two years. Uh, just strong, strong leadership uh, on this side of the business, specifically when you consider we're in a, a relatively old oil field space. The carding is now 90% or better of our production. You can see that occurs in Williston Green and Pemina, which is about a two and a half hour drive from our head office in Calgary to the Northwest. This is an old oil field. Our average guidance for this year, in the middle of our guidance is 5250. Again, above that 5,000 BVs a day we averaged in 2019. 
You take a look at our declines, low base declines, light oil, high net back, coupled with um, payouts of less than a year is what our capital efficiencies allow us to show growth. Our cost structures that have been reduced again are actually allowing us to show growth today in this $45 to $55 environment. So let's take a look at our operating margins. Again, every year we've been growing, even though WTI and the blue square has been going you know, up and down through that time frame. Of course, the margin shrunk significantly in 2020 when we had under $40 US WTI. But this year with our cost reductions, we expect our margins to get back to close to 58%, which will be our highest level ever. And that's on an average of about $50 WTI price or just under what we're using in our forecast. Williston Green, we are continually and consistently drilling pace setter one and a half extended reach horizontal wells there. We've been drilling consistently on this play over the last three years and we've been dropping our cost structures through the whole time frame. Economically, uh, we've been drilling one and one and a half mile wells. So you can see the type curve on the far right of the one and the one and a half mile wells. You got the costs, you get the reserves per well, IP90 is the production over 90 days, and IP365 is production over 365 days. The big thing to take a look at here is, in both cases, we're getting payouts in approximately a, a year around the $45, $50 uh, per barrel US um, pricing. So again, really, really strong payouts here. Pemina, we just got back to drilling Pemina about five quarters ago. And we are now drilling the fastest one mile wells in Pemina as well. And Pemina, we're gonna start drilling more and more wells in this, in this area as we move forward in the upcoming years. Now, again, with that said, um, we drilled six wells in the last five quarters. You can see them on the left here. That's our forecast and our type curve in the dark blue. You can see these wells are significantly exceeding our forecast. Even with the dips, which was us curtailing the production, during the pandemic, so we didn't sell our production or approved developed producing reserves at a loss. Again, let's take a look at the economics. So we're gonna start drilling with our new acquisition one and a, more one and a half mile wells as we believe they'll be more efficient. So that's in the orange and the one mile wells are in the blue. Again, you can see our cost structures, our reserve recoverables, our production over the first 90 days and over the first year in the, top, in the middle of the table. Now, with that said, our um, payouts, again, are give or take around a year. And I think once we get more active in this area, we'll be able to reduce costs some more and we'll be able to actually get even better economics on this play. Let's take a look at the acquisition we just did. It's in yellow here for a purchase price of $1.9 million, um, giving us our proved developed producing reserves in the ground under $2 a barrel. You know, we're doing it for in the low teens on a drill bit basis. We can't add production or reserves at these metrics. Under 8,000 of flowing barrel was the acquisition metrics. This is one times 2019 operating income. The contiguous lands allow us to start doing one and a half mile wells, as I mentioned, which is going to be a key for us going forward. We got about 30 wells in inventory, with 23 of them being what I would call top tier inventory that compete with, compete with all of our existing inventory. So a very, very exciting acquisition. In the red circle on the map, we have three wells in that north and that west corner of our play. You can see the type curves and the recoveries and cumes for those wells. The well number one is basically the best well ever drilled in Pemina. It's going to do 385,000 barrels and over 540,000 barrels of oil equivalent. So gas and natural gas liquids converted back to barrel. That's on a one mile well. We expect to be drilling one and a half mile wells. In fact, we are going to start a three well program here on a pad in the next few weeks. So in play drill times versus peers, we're best in class. On the top left in Williston Green is our um, is our drill curves. So from the top to the bottom and where the circle is, uh, using the bottom chart is our days to drill wells. We're consistently between 7.9 and 10.8 days. 
More importantly, the last three wells we did before Christmas was 7.9 to 8.8 .8 days. They were our most cost effective and efficient we've ever done. And completions were just as, just as good as, as the drilling side of things. If you take a look at the, uh, the bottom chart there, you can see Inplay's emblem. We are in the consistently 13 of our wells are in the top 25 ever drilled. And then two of the wells are in the fastest ones ever drilled in Williston Green for a one and a half mile well. Pemina, one mile wells, we're now doing the same. Very consistently drilling between 4.1 and 4.8 days here. You can see our um, wells in the bottom chart here. Our last three wells are the fastest wells ever drilled in Pemina. And five of our wells are in the top nine ever drilled. In both cases, we've been able to drop our capital costs in the last few years of approximately 25%, all adding to our continued capital efficiencies. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the Duvernay light oil shale play right now. This is a long-term play for us. Now, with that said, um, it's a significant amount of oil in place, just about 300 potential locations here. Now, it doesn't compete economically, especially at this lower price environment with the Cardium play. Now, with that said, once things change a bit, we'd like to potentially find some partners, some capital partners, or other partners to help us uh, start to exploit this play and delineate on this play. We're watching the activity around us significantly and there's lots going on. So if anybody uh, has any interest in it, uh, feel free to reach out. Our capital, pro, or our capital guidance and our, our guidance in 2021. So when we did our guidance, WTI was 49.50. It's closer to $53 today. At our guidance, we get about $57 Canadian as we get the we get to use the, the weaker Canadian dollar as we sell our oil in US dollars. We talked about our production forecast. So that provides about 30 and a half to 33.5 million um, dollars Canadian of adjusted funds flow. Now, drilling eight wells in a $23 million capital program shows us about seven to ten million dollars of free funds flow, which will be put to pay down debt. Again, a very enviable position. We expect our net debt this year to hover between 1.7 and 1.9 times net debt to EBITDA. Again, very, very strong turnaround and in a very, very solid position. So in summary, we have a very strong, technically focused management team operating a, obviously a sustainable company and with just what we went through uh, in this very uh, challenging environment. Our aggressive and effective response to COVID has now positioned us to be back to pre-COVID levels and now to measure growth with free funds flow. That top tier organic light oil production growth per share will generate between seven and 10 million or 23 and 30% of our funds flow is free, free funds flow. We're in a financially strong position with our debt to net, our net debt to EBITDA in 2021 already. We've done an acquisition, a tuck in, in 2020 in that difficult environment. So we are positioned to do more if those opportunities come along. Remember, I can't, I can't add production and, and reserves for what we did that acquisition for through the drill bit. Obviously, we have significant torque to uh, oil price upside. And, uh, you, you know, you can ask Michael if you ran a few different uh, uh, scenarios what that would look like, but it's significant. Our best in class operational and technical acumen is a key. Driving costs lowers, um, beating our production forecasts. All of those lead to strong capital efficiencies. And remember, I have said a few times in this presentation, that's the key to thriving in this fundamentally changed oil and gas industry, which is less access to outside capital. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I am uh, going to now open the floor up to Michael and uh, for anybody to uh, answer questions or ask questions. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Doug. I always start asking about hockey. Should we talk about hockey for a while or? I'm mm, just not no, really. We because... start doing that. Let's talk about your company. <laughs> I want to go back to your last press release because I, I think there were a lot of really uh, important, interesting things in that. And then certainly one of the most important is the capital budget. And you, you had a couple slides and you really talked about how you're able to drive down the costs by uh, 
by, by shrinking the time for drilling. Can you just kind of go a little bit more into detail on that and saying, oh, what is driving the, what's making things so much quicker? How are you able to do that? Uh, you know, we are continually tinking, tinkering and tweaking um, what we're doing on the capital side. I believe we're leading uh, the innovation and the technical changes in the cardio play. Um, you know, again, we've used, We've used a new drill bit again, which in turn many other uh, within our many other companies within our players starting to use that. Um, we've actually completely changed the wellbore design and the monobore uh, design throughout the uh, or throughout our play over time. On the completion side, it's the same. Uh, we went to we were one of the first ones to, to use sliding sleeves uh, completion technology, and then even after that. We kept changing them and working with the sliding sleeve companies to, to make improvements. And uh, what we're doing there just keeps getting better and better. And with the results, what we're doing is also allowing us operationally after the fact to um, have less workovers, less problems, less sand info from the fracking. So again, just everything is adding up, capital costs coming down. Uh, they're getting smoother, quicker, more efficient. Uh, with what we're doing. And then secondly, what we're doing is also adding to long-term operating cost reductions as well. So right across the board, that's good. Just a comment about, you know, in the spring, you know, we talked to all of our vendors and we're all in this together. And I mean, I'm really pleased that they all came to the table and, and, and helped us get through it. I um, mean, for the long haul, it was best for everybody. We saw, like I say, about 25% reductions from our original budget. And then, you know, I assume we're going to be 10 to 15% reductions in, in operating costs going forward. I mean, all bets are off if you get $70, $80 royal and if the industry gets really busy. But, I mean, I don't know too many people that are forecasting those, those type of prices. So it sounds like there's a little bit of a combination of operating efficiencies, yeah. vendors being a little bit more uh, accommodating. Is there more fine-tuning to go? Or can costs continue to go down? Uh, there always is. I mean, we haven't stopped and, and, you know, we just seem to get better and better every year. So, uh, I, you know, technology is changing all the time and, and, you know, that's what's, that's what's fundamentally, that's what changed the industry and allowed that production growth in the States was just continually, uh, optimizing the technology around drilling and completion. So, uh, you know, we've, we've, you know, I think peak oil was supposed to occur in the seventies. So, uh, you know, we just keep finding new reserves that were harder to get, but with technology, we're able to drop the costs and, uh, you know, that's where we are today. And you're talking eight wells next year, equally split. It looks like I saw three to five in both Williston and three to five in Pembia. Is that right? That's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, it, it just depends on, on timing, access to land. We do have a little bit of, uh, you know, a spring breakup issue in Canada when the frost comes out of the ground and, and moving stuff around. So, you know, where we can get to. We like to start our second, uh, after the first quarter, we'll drill three wells, but in the second quarter, we like to start before the end of the second quarter, but it's very difficult to get in most of our areas much before uh, June 1st. So, um, you know, again, just depending on access, we'll uh, we'll hit the next set of wells will be in, in either Willie Green or Pemina, but uh, pretty balanced. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. You led right into my, you know, the question I was going to ask about just kind of the timing. She said three, probably in the first quarter. So this isn't necessarily evenly split to a quarter over the year. No, I mean, it's, it's, we've got a three roll pad that we'll be starting in the, in the next week to 10 days uh, in Pemina. Uh, then we're going to be in Williston Green, um, probably in Williston Green in June, um, just depending on access, it, it's typically a little easier. And then probably you're looking at another two well pad in Pemina, um, but it could, those two could swap and we'll see how it goes, I guess. And, you know, we have the potential to drill two, three well pads there too, if pricing stays strong. So lots of opportunity, lots of optionality. Um, you know, if pricing goes down, we, we would potentially reduce that capital program. But I mean, we are, we're showing free funds flow to below $45 WTI right now. So we're in a good spot. So you are pretty much answered one of my next questions. It is how <laughs> you are to, to change things. It, it's not hard to get board approval. You can add another well and very quickly if prices are up. Yeah, I mean, we're having, you know, board meetings every quarter and, and, you know, we, we don't drill, like, it's not like we drill, 
you know, one well consistently over three or four months. We, we like, due to effectiveness and efficiencies, we like to drill them on pad basis. And that's how we get the, the great cost structures. And so it's always, we never drill less than two or three wells on a pad at a time, which in turn is, is uh, um, you know, how we do things. But, you know, we're, we're basically meeting, you know, every three months uh, with the board and, and sooner if we need to be. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. So you gave the guidance for the year of 5,100 to 5,400 BOE a day. Kara, would you be willing to throw out an exit rate for end of the year? Uh, it'd be on the high end or, or past the 5,400 range. I mean, the last three wells are programmed for about uh, uh, September, October. So you'll getting you'll be getting the peak production from those in uh, you know November or basically around Christmas time. So you know it, it should be at the high end or, or above that uh, above that guidance. Okay. We do have one question from the audience, so I'm just going to read it. Are in place directors and large insider shareholders interested in increasing their respective shares in the company? Um, I mean, I, I think the the large inside shareholders right now are are happy with their position. Um, you know, they they you know it's been a it's been a challenging time at, at, over the last few years. So, uh, but they've been you know solid mainstay mainstays here, supportive. Um, you know, the one thing I can say is, you know, they're not in a, any position or, or have any desire to uh, to sell any of their position. That's the one thing. They're, they're private equity backed uh, or the private equity company. So, I mean, uh, you know, they, they they can be, they're very solid. Their their 100% focus has been uh, Canadian oil and gas exploration and production companies. So uh, um, they've, they've got good backing and, and they've been solid, solid shareholders and supporters. Let's talk a little bit about this free cash flow, the seven to ten million. And I, you know, it's fun to start asking questions like this again. But uh, tell, explain me a little bit more how the business development uh, loan works, and, and when you start talking about some, it's obviously very good terms on the, the VDC note. Do you have to pay that off first, or where does the seven to ten million go to pay down debt? Does it go to the VDC first, or does it go mm -hmm. to the other credit line? Uh, yeah, no, it goes to the uh, first lien um, on the first lien side. So it's it's basically our revolving uh, our revolver line is what it'll uh, go against. Um, with that said, uh, yeah, the, the term loan is a term loan. Um, it doesn't have to be paid before four years. So I guess that'd be October of end of October two thousand and twenty four. I mean, you're you're looking at you know six to seven and a half percent interest rate on a on a term loan, which is for a small company is, is unheard of. Um, so it's, it's great terms. Uh, in the meantime, you know, it's just dealing with your, your first lien lenders is, is the key. And then this, with that term that allows us a lot of optionality and time working with our, with our reserve base lenders. And I mean, to put it in perspective, our two members of our syndicate also participated in that second lien loan. So they're, they're in both sides of, of our, our, our business in the first lien and the second lien. So they've seen all of our modeling, they've seen our forecasts and they participated uh, happily within that BDC loan. So again, you know, everybody's pretty much on the same wavelength here. If we stay above $50 prices, does that change this, mod, um, this uh, talk about paying down debt? Do you, no, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, I think this is going to be an industry phenomenon for a while is, is, I mean, you're hearing it everywhere is free cash flow or free funds flow. People, uh, I mean, we've all debted, most people have gone added debt to their, to their balance sheet over the last year uh, due to the pandemic and the pricing and uh, the access to capital is, is not the same as it was. So, you know, access to debts become a lot more difficult. So you, you want to maintain your relationships and do a good job with those. Uh, those current structures, and then you're um, so when you take a look at the you know the equity side is is not as simple as it was, or there's not as much access to that as well. But even with that said, you know, like do you want to dilute at these prices is the second question. So um, you know that's that's the that's that's the fr time, the framework we're working within these days. And I think it's like I say, it's an industry phenomenon. Like you know, I know in Canada, it, you know. Free cash flow, free cash flow, free cash flow. That's the that's the consistent commentary out of uh, uh, out of all the producers here right now. You've always kind of lived within your cash flow, but to use the excess cash flow to actually pay down debt is a little bit new, and it goes against the industry norm, which tends to be let's expand as quick as much as we can. 
Um, is that maybe the question to ask, is that a change in how investors are looking at companies like yours? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, first of all, you got to survive. So again, you can't, you know, our debt structures are going to come down from, you know, significantly higher than what we are projecting uh, in 2021. And, and again, you know, at $50 WTI, I'd like to get that, that debt, you know, below one and a half times um, or even lower potentially. Um, but again, I think I mentioned it, you know, Bay Street, Wall Street, these guys are, are expecting more return on capital employed uh, as compared to just growth for growth's sake. And, and again, like we do have, there's some excess supply in the world. So, so why do you want to grow at a, a ridiculously fast pace, um, you know, increasing uh, potentially oversupply here in the future? And I, and I couple that with, um, you know, if I could do more tuck-ins like I did, that's going to be a better way for us to to add growth and use some of that free cash flow over time. So, you know, that'll be a continued focus and priority for us. We've done a good job. Anything we've bought in the Cardium, um, we've exploited and, and really shown increased value in anything that we've bought. And I mean, I, I can tell you this, this latest acquisition, we are excited and hence why we're drilling, you know, within three months uh, on this play. It's 100% working interest. We have total control and pace of development here. We don't have to deal with partners. So uh, it's a, it was it was a fabulous tuck in for us. Well, can't argue with one year return on investment. So. Um, okay, speaking of growth, you, you were a company that always prided yourself on, on production growth. And obviously last year kind of hurt that a little bit, but you had a great <laughs> slide in there showing you're almost going 15%. Do you think we can get back to that type of level of growth? Or given what we're doing, spending the money more on debt, that maybe we shouldn't have that high an expectation. I mean, that could occur. I mean, a little bit higher pricing. You gotta, you gotta decide with all that free cash flow. What do you want to do, right? And the options are um, pay down debt, acquisitions, or um, you know, add more drill bit growth. And all of those are on the table as pricing increases. Um, you know, you can take a look at it, but, you know, in the near term, we just want to get our, our balance sheet back in line and put us in a, in a, in a solid, sustainable position, um, you know, over the next year. And then after that, you, again, you know, you have three options and, uh, um, you know, if we do pay down debt, I mean, the odds are I'd like to do a little bigger, bigger, uh, um, uh, you know, transaction to get us, to get us to another size, uh, especially if we could do it at, uh, at, the prices that we've been seeing or potentially should be seeing in the, in the upcoming years. But in the meantime, it, yeah, it's all a function of, of how much free funds flow you have and, and what are the opportunities and the options in front of you. There's another option for cash flow too. Your stock price is trading at a third of what it was before uh, the pandemic. And now, but even though we're back to oil prices, pre-pandemic levels and your production levels pre-pandemic, do you ever think about using the cash flow to repurchase shares? Um, we do. Uh, I mean, uh, when we did the BDC loan, I mean, we have to, we have to get approval to be doing any, uh, share repurchases, uh, uh, at this, at this case or in that scenario. But I mean, it's a, it's a option that could occur. I think they'd want to see, like I say, some of the debt down on the, the total net debt down before that happens. But that's, that's just, uh, one of the pieces of the buy there that, uh, that we can uh, can be looking at for sure. You added added some hedge positions uh, with the last news announcement. It, it's take advantage of the rise in oil prices. Is that a change in long term philosophy or just being short term advantageous? Um, no, I mean I think you're going to see us hedge more. Um, you know, try and put some floors on. We might lose a little bit, but uh, we've been always trying to do shorter term hedges. You know, we're within a year. Um, just to lock in where we are at today's pricing and, you know, our guidance, you know, if you could lock in, you know, above $50 right now to a certain, a certain amount of our production, you know, that's puts us in a pretty good position and, and, and let's not kid ourselves. The lenders, uh, like the hedging as well. They, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, they don't, they don't tell you to do it, but they're, uh, they're winking at you that they'd like to see some hedges and, you know, protect the volatility that we've seen over the last few years and, and that downside. So, 
Uh, you know, that's that's one of the things we're, we're just monitoring and managing as we move forward. But we're typically still been staying with the shorter term hedges, you know, upwards of a year. We recently just put some in for uh, uh, to the end of 2021 for the second half of the year as well. So uh, you'll see more and more, like more continuous and short term from us. So the way to think about it or the way you're thinking about it is locking in. You've got some very good returns on the investment. You showed that, that, that when you have the chance to lock some of that in, you lock in yeah. one half. Um, yeah, up to half. That's typically what we do. I mean, we can go a little bit higher, but yeah, 50% is a good number. And again, it, it's protected capital program too, right? Like that's that's a key. Um, you know, if you can see, see good returns at this pricing, uh, you know, you get that flush production of those new wells coming on and it, it's nice to see that at a, at a reasonable price. And, you know, that's why, you know, there's lots of issues last year, especially in Canada, where you you got to spend you got to spend a lot fair chunk of money in the first quarter because Q2 is is the breakup period and if you don't you know you you got a long time between drilling and, and declining production so i mean a lot of people in 2020 spent their money in Q1 and then we just had you know a complete uh, fall off the cliff in WTI prices at the end of Q1 which in turn you know your your production or your new wells was being sold at uh, at very low prices which again like us and most people we curtailed um, which which we had to do, or and there was no use uh, selling it at a loss. But um, you know that's that's the story there. What are you hearing about your neighboring companies uh, now that we're back up above fifty? Uh, I mean, you know, I, again, free cash flow is 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 the key term. Paying down debt in in most cases here in Canada is is uh, is a common theme. Um, you know. You're starting to see less and less small companies that we've seen some processes. Some have been successful, some haven't been successful. Um, but I do think you're going to see more uh, M&A activity, especially out of the mid size, the, the, the mid cap to the uh, senior companies. Uh, you know, they will be looking for, for assets. As I said, it, you know, you could add assets, low decline assets for pretty much cheaper than you can add through the drill bit. So I, I do think you'll start seeing more acquisition activity uh, as we move forward, um, and it'll help with the balance sheets cleaning up uh, on the on the M and A on the M and A front. So uh, you know that's that's a pretty common theme uh, right across the board here. But not so much increasing drilling. You you had the chart with which, which yeah. that's kind of surprised me that the rig count has not been jumping up in reaction to oil prices, which is keeping oil prices uh, higher, but you're not seeing uh, an increase in drilling necessarily in, in your areas? No, the rig counts in Canada have been like, yeah, as pricing's rising, have been rising a little bit, but not not like they used to. Like Q1, uh, Q1 rig count right now is, is significant lower than we, we would have seen in the last few years uh, in Canada. So again, it's back to live within your means. It's, it's back to pay down debt. Um, you know, it's a, it's a common theme. Free cash flow, you know, the, the intermediates and the, and the larger caps that pay, pay dividends have been slowly tweaking their dividend up a little bit. Those are the, the common themes you're hearing. But, uh, uh, you know, nobody is jumping to add, um, you know, drill bit, significant drill bit growth right now. It's all small growth and uh, pay down debt and dividends if you can can do that, things like that. Sounds like last year scared a lot of people. Well, but it goes back to that lack of, of capital, right? Like, you, you know, to get debt capital or equity capital, it's not simple. And, and it's not as easy as it once was. So that's the other part of the picture. So, and, and you're, you know, coupled with last year, that's why you're seeing a lot more conservativeness uh, on, the, on the drilling side of the business and the, and the capital allocation. Do you know of companies that have just exited the areas you're drilling in? Uh, not, no, not really exited. I mean, um, in our area, in the Cardium, the companies, you know, there's a select group of companies in there and, and they've actually started drilling again, um, slowly, but again, not for growth. It seems to be drilling to stay flat. Um, you know, you do have a certain amount of fixed costs, so you want to keep your production relatively stable and, and uh, manage the fixed costs. Um, but, uh, you know, again, not aggressive drilling, not aggressive activity in the field and, and uh, the growth you know, not, you know, not looking at, at significant or sizable growth is, is uh, you know, a concurrent theme. Let's just play the hypothetical that it does start to really pick up in, in the Candium. Talk a little bit about the infrastructure, uh, you know, what, how, 
the, the ability to, of drillers to react to the, the pipeline capacity, et cetera? Um, so again, it depends on how quickly the activity goes up. And I mean, to me, that's a function of oil price. I mean, if it went to $70, like you'll see uh, appreciation and cost structure pretty quickly. The big key will be, there's equipment. The big key is just getting, you know, people, it'll take time to get people to fill the, uh, the, uh, the positions, to get employees to fill the positions. Um, but again, it, you're going to need significantly higher uh, oil prices. Otherwise, it seems pretty, pretty measured growth here. And, um, you know, or, or use of, of drilling rigs and the equipment that's associated with it. So I, I would, you know, it, you get to $60, you're going to see a little bit more activity, but it just, it's just seems different. And I always say all bets are off though, when you get to $70, $80 and, you know, you get lots of cash flow and, you know, what do you do with it sort of thing. Um, you know, the easiest the acquisitions tend to get a little bit more difficult at higher prices. And, you know, the easiest thing to do is, is add to the drill bit or, I guess, you know, pay down debt, but, you know, you could start dividends as well or, or increase dividends of the already dividend players as well. So that's the, those are the, the, fa the factors that I see here uh, in the next, uh, in the next year, two years, depending on your view of the prices, but uh, it, it should be manageable. You, you did a nice little, we talked about the little, uh, what I'll call a tuck-in acquisition. Do you ever think about bigger areas? You've already got the next, you got the East uh, Duvernay, to, you got the area to go to next if prices are high enough, but would you do a larger acquisition in the, uh, in your areas? The simple answer is yes, if the right opportunity comes along, for sure. I mean, I, I, that's, you know, I didn't say it, but another common theme is, is, a, is a bit bigger. Bigger is better these days as well. Like people are looking at that, um, you know, you get more synergies, more cost structures, uh, you know, synergies allowing your cost structures to come down. So, uh, you know, again, that, that's a, that tends to be a common theme right now as well. How, how do you think the larger players are viewing the cadium right now? The cardium? Cardium, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, well, again, I mean, you know, there are some larger players in the cardium. Um, again, low decline, um, high net backs. Um, that's what's key for them, especially those dividend payers. So again, I, I, I think um, as you get more consolidation in the play um, and, and the bigger guys, if they, you know, they're not going to go buy 200 barrels and, and you know, probably not even a thousand barrels, but if you can get some consolidation occurring and you get 5,000 or 10,000 barrels of, of consolidated production, and I think you're going to see, uh, um, you know, a little more interest from the, the mid or, or larger cap companies. Um, you know, again, I think White Cap Resources already plays in the, in the Cardium. Vermilion Energy plays in the Cardium. So those are those are two sizable companies. Arc Resources plays in the Cardium, and Obsidian Energy are, are I mean, not big market cap, but, but sizable companies that play in the in the Cardium as far as Obsidian. But you know, they're the other the other ones are fairly sizable, um, well established, um, strong. Uh, what I would call intermediate to senior type light oil companies. We've gone through all my questions. We've got one minute left, so I'm just going to ask who's going to win the Northern Division this year. Oh, gosh. It's a crapshoot. My team's starting out very poorly, the Oilers. But, uh, um, you know, I, I don't know. Like, it, it, I, I can't even predict it right now. It's just so early, and, and with the short training camps, I got no clue what to uh, – uh, you know, how these guys are going to evolve in the, in the upcoming months, but uh, it could be just about anybody. I mean, Montreal from last to uh, close to first right now is looking really good. So well, it's tough. we'll check back with you later. We are <laughs> out of time and we have a, a dead stop. So we'll leave it there. I'll just quickly mention that uh, you'll be participating in an energy panel we have tomorrow at 515. Uh, please, uh, if you're interested in that, listen in on that. So thank you, Doug. And uh, we'll uh, talk to you later. Pleasure, Michael.